Welcome, everybody. This is our 11th Ann Klebanski Visiting Lecture. My name is Ann Levy. I am the Senior Program Manager at the Center for Faculty Development at Mass General Hospital. In today's session, we have invited Dr. Tali Amir from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to present on the emerging role of contrast mammography. I'm going to engage in a brief history of the Ann Klebanski Visiting Scholar Award Program. It was created by our former CFD director, Miriam Bradella, to offer MGH women faculty the opportunity to serve as a virtual visiting professor and give grand rounds or other special lectures at a national or international institution organized by the scholars champion, a senior faculty member at MGH and the CFD. Next slide. The program and accompanying lecture series is named after Ann Klebanski, the current president and CEO of Mass General Brigham and former director of the Center for Faculty Development. A highly successful researcher, Dr. Klebanski has been a strong supporter and advocate for women. Next slide. The program began in 2020 during COVID. Here is our original cohort of 36 scholars. Next slide, the second cohort, 2021 to 2022, included 32 scholars. And in 2223, last year, we had 31 scholars. This, our fourth year, includes 29 new Ann Klebanski scholars. Next slide. The program would not be successful without the commitment and energy of our Ann Klebanski scholar champions who are helping this year's scholars find so many exciting speaking engagements at the national and international level. Next slide. The goal of this series that you're attending today, the Ann Klebanski Visiting Lecture Series, is to catalyze and foster collaborations across national and international institutions. Next slide. You can see here in this slide, a few of the institutions we've collaborated with through the last four years, and highlighted in yellow is Mem Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the logo of it, which represents Dr. Amir. And now, slide 14, please, Dr. Mancy Saxena, who is part of this year's cohort of Ann Klebanski visiting scholars, will introduce Dr. Amir, who is here virtually from Memorial Sloan Kettering, the institution that hosted Dr. Saxena's virtual talk as part of this program. Dr. Saxena? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Um, I just wanted to add to the announcements that this program would not be successful without Dr. Ann Levy, who is uh, who manages the program and is very kind and thoughtful to all the awardees. So thank you, Ann, for all your work. Uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome Dr. Tali Amir. Dr. Amir is an assistant attending radiologist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She subspecializes in breast imaging. She earned her medical degree from Robert Wood Johnson, Rutgers University, and completed her residency in diagnostic radiology at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and then went on to do a fellowship in breast imaging at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Amir's research focuses on improving breast cancer screening and diagnosis, particularly through new technologies, including the use of contrast-enhanced mammography, artificial intelligence, decision support in breast ultrasound evaluation, and 3D image guided procedures. Her research has also examined how to maximize technological opportunities to improve the patient experience in the academic breast imaging environment. She is the author of multiple peer-reviewed scientific journal publications, as well as multiple oral presentations at national meetings. Welcome, Dr. Amir. We are honored to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. So thank you again for that introduction. And yes, I'm gonna to chat today about the emerging role of contrast-enhanced mammography. I have nothing to disclose. 
I'm going to start by going over the rationale behind contrast enhanced mammography or CEM, and then move on to discuss technique. I'll guide us through CEM interpretation using our 2022 BiRed supplement. And I'll share a number of clinical case examples. I'll touch briefly on CEM guided biopsies and then finish with practical take home points. So we'll start with rationale and technique. And to do that, I wanna actually take a step back and first touch on our standard mammogram. And when I say standard mammogram, I'm referring to full field digital mammography, which is 2D mammogram or digital breast tomosynthesis or 3D mammography. And a mammogram is essentially an X-ray of the breast. And when we look at the breast, we see predominantly two tissue types, our fibroglandular tissue and the fatty tissue. The fibroglandular tissue appears as white on the mammogram or radio opaque, and the fatty tissue appears as a dark gray or black. And you can see that there are varying ratios or densities of the fibroglandular tissue to the fatty tissue. On the left, we see an almost entirely fatty breast where we see predominantly that dark gray tissue. And as we move to the right, to our heterogeneously dense and extremely dense breasts, we see much more fibroglandular tissue. The challenge here in breast cancer screening and detection is that cancers are radioopaque predominantly or white. So I've drawn for us a white circle to represent our cancer. And we can see that on the leftmost image, that white circle or our cancer is fairly obvious surrounded by the dark gray or black tissue. But if we go to example, to our image third from the left, our heterogeneously dense breast, that white circle is almost invisible. It's obscured by the overlapping white fibroglandular tissue. And this is our challenge in detecting breast cancer in a breast dense, in a dense breast. And it's, this is known as masking effect, where we have overlapping radiopaque dense tissue obscuring or masking our cancers. And studies show, and I think as is intuitive from those images I showed you, as mammographic density increases, our sensitivity decreases. Additionally, dense breasts are an independent risk factor for breast cancer, even when we account for masking effect. So here enters contrast enhanced mammography. CEM was FDA approved in 2011. And in addition to this anatomic assessment we have with our standard mammogram, we add in a blood flow assessment by utilizing iodinated IV contrast. And we're taking advantage of tumor associated angiogenesis such that a tumor should enhance more than the surrounding breast parenchyma, which may also enhance. And so this theory here, the process we're using is similar to MRI, but in contrast to MR, it's more accessible and it's also more affordable, about 25% the cost of MRI. Additionally, we don't have concerns surrounding gadolinium deposition in the brain, which is its own conversation, um, but something that patients come to us with concern about. And so it's not even something we need to think about. How do we perform a contrast mammogram? We use dual energy imaging. So we take a low energy and a high energy digital mammogram after we inject the IV contrast. It's a weight-based dose of 1.5 ml per kgs. We inject via a power injector at three mLs per second. And then post-processing is performed and we have an iodine map. When we inject the contrast, the breast is not compressed because we want to facilitate blood flow or contrast into the breast. Our first image is obtained about three minutes post-injection, and then we perform our four routine projections within five to six minutes of injection. So if a patient has two breasts, our standard mammogram projections are two images within each breast for a total of four images. If we're imaging both breasts or, or a patient who has both breasts, we want to make sure that we obtain the same view in each breast while the contrast is maximally present. However, if one breast is requiring particular attention, so for example, we have a newly diagnosed right breast cancer, then we may obtain both views in the right breast. So these are the three images we obtain. On the left, we have our low energy image, and this is below the K edge of iodine and really shows our breast parenchyma. The high energy image we spoke about is above the K edge of iodine and shows our iodine concentration and our breast parenchyma. 
And then our last image here is that post-processed image that shows our contrast. We call it the recombined image. And that's isolating the iodine concentration only. And when we interpret these images, we're really looking at the first and the last image. I wanna talk about this low energy image. It appears similar to our 2D mammogram. And as I discussed, it's below our cage of iodine, which means the x-rays are not being stopped by iodine. And the question of course is, well, it may look like our 2D mammogram, but is it equivalent? And this question of course was asked and answered. Um, and a group looked at 170 breasts in 88 patients and looking at calcifications and breast lesion size determined that the low energy image in our CEM is equivalent to the standard full field digital mammogram, despite the presence of IV contrast. You may hear a number of different terms for contrast enhanced mammography, spectral mammography, digital. The preferred term is contrast enhanced mammography, CEM, because it avoids overlap with proprietary names. Additionally, that contrast image or that post-processed image we call the recombined image. The radiation dose is something our patients ask us about. We're performing two separate exposures per image. So in a patient with two breasts where we would have otherwise had four images, we are now obtaining eight. And the radiation dose estimates are varied. Some suggest a radiation dose may be up to 81% higher for CEM than our standard 2D mammogram. But regardless, it remains in a safe and regulatory range. We can use CEM for a variety of indications. It's great for extensive disease and a newly diagnosed breast cancer. We can also assess neoadjuvant chemotherapy response. It's a good problem solving tool. We use it in the intermediate and high risk screening population and also as an alternative if a patient cannot undergo MR. And studies show it has excellent performance. It has increased sensitivity and specificity compared to digital mammography and comparable sensitivity and even greater specificity for preoperative MR than preoperative MR. And so here's an image of all three studies we just spoke about. On the left, we have our standard mammogram. And you can see that the patient has dense breasts and a fairly complex parenchymal pattern. Our middle image is our recombined image from a contrast mammogram, and you can see an enhancing mass in the retriolar tissue. And then the correlate enhancing mass on the maximal intensity projection image of the MR. And so you can see that this cancer is nearly invisible on the 2D mammogram, but quite obvious on our contrast images. This is an example of a patient who presented with nipple pain and retraction. On the left image, our standard mammogram, we can appreciate that the nipple is flattened and retracted, but otherwise, it's not very telling. Our middle image, the recombined image of our CEM though, shows segmental enhancement, and then the correlate enhancement on the MRI in the last image, and this is a case of invasive ductal carcinoma. Some practical considerations when performing CEM. There's little data to support timing during any particular menstrual phase cycle. It's important that we have a dedicated CEM slot when we're scheduling because we require personnel to assist us. We talked about this requires a weight-based dose, so we need personnel to weigh the patient. We need personnel to start the IV line, and we also need clinicians to monitor for contrast reactions. It's also important to keep in mind that the order of the projections may vary, not only from technologist to technologist, but site to site across institutions. Limitations of contrast mammography include the fact that we're using an iodinated contrast. So we have to be mindful of renal insufficiency and also be mindful of prior contrast reactions and have somebody to monitor potential contrast reactions. Additionally, CEM guided biopsy is not widely available. And so we have to have a plan to evaluate potential abnormalities with alternate modalities. So 3D mammography, ultrasound or MRI, for biopsy planning. And if we don't see a correlate on these other modalities, we can consider six month follow-up contrast enhanced mammography, but there is some data to challenge this algorithm. Unlike an MRI, we have a more limited field of view to assess the posterior breast, the axilla and the chest wall. I also mentioned that the 
parenchyma of the breast may naturally enhance. This is called background parenchymal enhancement, and that's going to lower our sensitivity, just like we see with MRI. Benign lesions will also enhance, and that's going to lower our specificity, again, just like MRI. And with all imaging uh, modalities, we have to be mindful of artifacts that might compromise our image quality. CM has been studied in dense breasts. Uh, one study looked at 89 patients with dense breasts, 100 lesions. The low energy images or that 2D equivalent was read blindly first, followed by the exam in its entirety. And they found that with CEM, sensitivity improved from 71.5% to 92.7%, and specificity improved from 51.8% to 67.9%. CEM is a great tool in higher risk women. A retrospective study performed at our institution a few years ago looked at 900 baseline CEM in the higher than average risk population. This included 77.4% with dense breasts, 27.3% with a family history, a uh, first degree relative diagnosed before the age of 50 and 40.2% with a personal history of breast cancer. And they found 15 cancers in 14 women, which is a cancer detection rate of 15.5 per thousand women. The PPV3, which is our positive predictive value for biopsies was 29.4%. Two interval cancers were found in at one year follow-up. The sensitivity for the low energy images was low, 50% but the entire CEM exam had a sensitivity of 87.5%. The specificity was 93.7%. Last year, radiology published a very nice systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at 60 studies, 11,049 CEM exams with 10,605 patients. They looked at low energy and RI sensitivity together compared to the recombined images alone and found that there was higher sensitivity and specificity. When they looked at CEM exams with mammographic findings that were suspicious, there was a 92% pooled sensitivity and 84% pooled specificity. And looking at studies of dense breasts, 95% pooled sensitivity and 78% pooled specificity. So they concluded that CEM demonstrated high performance in breast cancer detection, especially when there was joint interpretation of the low energy and those recombined images or the contrast images. Another study looked at meta-analysis at comparing the contrast enhanced mammography with MRI. They looked at 13 studies and found that both were highly sensitive in detecting breast cancer. Many who practice breast imaging, as I share this data comparing CEM to 2D mammography are probably thinking, that's great, but we do most of our mammograms with digital breast tomosynthesis or 3D guidance. And this is a good question. And the ACR right now has the CMIST trial, contrast enhanced mammography imaging screening trial, CMIST, comparing CEM to 3D mammogram or DBT in women with dense breasts. This will be a two-year trial and it's across institutions. I'm gonna move on now to guide us through CEM interpretation. So our BIRADS manual, is a manual that we rely on in breast imaging. And in 2022, a supplement was published to include contrast enhanced mammography. Our BIRADS supplement is incredibly important because it allows us or ensures that we have a standardized lexicon that we're using, that we're all speaking the same language. It enables consistent reporting. And very importantly, it enables validation of our standardized terms, particularly when we're looking at studies of CEM performance. When we interpret a mammogram, we want to interpret the low energy and the recombined images. We describe them separately, and then we create a synthesized impression. We may have a significant finding on one or both views, and then our final assessment is going to be guided by our most suspicious finding. The low energy images are read just like our standard 2D mammograms, and then our recombined images use a lexicon that is similar to MRI, but not identical we have fewer descriptors. The first thing we describe when looking at a contrast enhanced mammogram is our background parenchymal enhancement. And this may range from minimal to marked. This is the amount of enhancement of the normal breast tissue. Importantly, this may not follow the breast density. So we may have an extremely dense breast that has minimal enhancement. 
there are three enhancement patterns that we describe on those recombined images or those contrast images, mass, non-mass, and enhancing asymmetry. Focus, which we use in MRI, is not part of the CEM lexicon. A mass is a 3D space-occupying lesion with convex outward contours, and it may or may not have a low energy equivalent. And if there is no equivalent, the mass shape and the margin are going to be characterized on those recombined images, and of course the internal enhancement will be as well. A mass can be described as oval-shaped or elliptical, two to three undulations. Here's an example of an invasive ductal carcinoma that presented as an oval enhancing mass. Round, so circular, this is an enhancing lymph node. Or irregular, I think what many of us think of when we think of an invasive ductal carcinoma, this is neither round nor oval. We also want to describe the margins. A margin may be circumscribed, meaning that the entire margin is sharply demarcated. We see an abrupt transition between the lesion and the tissue. This is an example of a circumscribed mass, which is a fibroadenoma, a benign tumor. The margin can also be not circumscribed. In this top image, you see an irregular mass. It has uneven or jagged edges, and this is an invasive ductal carcinoma on the top. And on the bottom, we have a spiculated mass, also an invasive ductal carcinoma, but here we see lines emanating from the mass. Lastly, we describe the internal enhancement of the mass we're seeing on CEM. This is an example of a homogeneously enhancing mass. You can see that it's confluent and uniform. It's a fibroadenoma. Internal enhancement may be heterogeneous, so non-uniform and variable, as in this case of invasive ductal carcinoma. And lastly, rim enhancement. So enhancement that's pronounced peripherally. On the left, we see a peripherally enhancing cyst. And on the right, fat necrosis. And we can see on the middle image, that's the recombined image, we see peripheral enhancement. And on the far right image, we have a sagittal T1 non-fat sat image showing central fat. And this is classic fat necrosis. Dark internal septations is a term that we use on MRI that is not part of our CEM lexicon. The next type of enhancement is non-mass enhancement. And there's only two components we describe here, distribution and the internal enhancement. We have a variety of descriptors for distribution. It can be diffuse, as in this case of invasive lobular carcinoma. We may also see multiple discrete regions. This is a case of multicentric IDC and DCIS. Regional enhancement, this is a case of pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia or PASH, which can mimic cancer. Focal non-mass enhancement, this is our IDC. This is a very nice example of linear non-mass enhancement in the setting of DCIS, or segmental in this case of invasive lobular. And the internal enhancement, enhancement characteristics are just like for mass, so we can have homogeneous enhancement, which we can see in the setting of IDC. Heterogeneous enhancement, this is a case of DCIS with microinvasion, or clumped non-mass enhancement, this is ILC. Lastly, we have enhancing asymmetry. So this is different from our MRI lexicon. This is when we see abnormal enhancement on only one recombined image. We're going to describe the internal enhancement just the way we did for mass and non-mass as either homogeneous or heterogeneous. And very importantly, a one view only enhancing finding cannot be dismissed simply because it's seen on only one view. Here's an example of an enhancing asymmetry appreciated on only the MLO projection. And you can see there's no correlate on the CC projection, but this is a true finding with a correlate on MRI. Now I'm going to walk us through some case examples. And I'll go through screening, diagnostic, known cancers, and pitfalls and artifacts. So this is a 54-year-old woman with a remote history of lumpectomy who presented for post-lumpectomy screening. This is her 2D mammogram with post-lumpectomy changes, but otherwise a normal mammogram. But on her contrast images, we can see there's an enhancing mass anterolateral to the lumpectomy bed. Ultrasound was done with no sonographic correlate identified. At this time, we did not have CEM guided biopsy, so MRI was done for further evaluation. And we can see an enhancing mass um, on our post-contrast image here that corresponds to the contrast finding on mammogram. So this was biopsied under MRI guidance. And very importantly, we always want to assess our post-procedure mammogram. When we do a biopsy, we place a biopsy marker. 
And we want to ensure that the biopsy marker is landing in the location of our initially of our initial finding of concern. And you can see here that there's a small hourglass marker in the same location as the contrast finding. And this was a diagnosis of invasive lobular carcinoma, where you could see the, the 2D mammogram would have been read as normal. So this was only seen on our contrast images. Here's a BRCA2 patient who is unable to tolerate MRI for screening. This is her, on the left is her current mammogram and on the right is her mammogram from 11 years prior. There's a stable asymmetry in the upper breast. On the CC projection, we see that asymmetry again, stable for over a decade. However, in the retroreolar tissue, we see a small asymmetry. On the contrast images, however, we see a small enhancing mass, which is much more obvious than the small asymmetry we saw in the 2D image. So what's our next step? We're gonna ultrasound for further evaluation. And indeed on retroreolar ultrasound, we see an irregular mass that was suspicious. We biopsied and again, we assess that post-procedure marker placement and it's exactly where we anticipated based on that enhancing mass we saw on the CEM. And this came back as 0.8 centimeter, poorly differentiated IDC with DCIS. Sentinel node showed macrometastasis with extracapsular extension. And so this is an example of a small subtle cancer with clinically significant disease. Next, this is a 59-year-old female with history of LCIS for screening. This is her mammogram, and I'm sure it's on a non-clinical monitor. It's impossible to see, but I promise there were some calcifications of interest, and so magnification views were done. And there were some calcifications that were suspicious indeed. Very importantly, regardless of enhancement, these calcifications need to be assessed independently based on their morphology, such that if they're suspicious, it doesn't matter if there is no associated enhancement, we need to pursue biopsy. However, on our CEM images, there was enhancement, and not just in the area of the calcifications, but in additional areas. An ultrasound was performed of these areas with correlate masses. Biopsy was done of two of them, and you can see that the markers are in location of two of the areas of enhancement. And this came back multicentric invasive ductal carcinoma. So this is a really nice example of CEM showing a greater extent of disease than the standard views allowed us to appreciate. I'll move on to some diagnostic cases. This is a 39-year-old female with a palpable mass in the upper outer breast. She had a family history of breast cancer. You can see she has extremely dense breasts and a fairly complex parenchymal pattern. The triangular marker denotes where she's feeling her palpable lump, and there is an obscured mass, but it's difficult to discern much. And on the recombined images, we see a thin peripheral enhancing mass, and we actually see a similar finding on the other breast. One thing we can do is to look back and see if this patient has had any other screening MRIs. And in fact, she has. On the left is our T2-weighted image, so this is our water-sensitive sequence. In the bottom right is our post-contrast traction image. And you can see that there's a T2 hyper-intense peripherally enhancing mass that's consistent with a benign cyst. And you can see the correlate on our current recombined image on the top right. And so, as I said, this was a benign cyst. Next case is a 72-year-old woman with a left breast palpable mass. So right in front of the triangular marker, there's a small mass, that's just a skin mole. But deep and just posterior, there's an asymmetry. Interestingly, there's intervening fat in the asymmetry, which is usually a reassuring sign to the breast immature that this may be benign. But when we look on the contrast images, there's enhancement associated, and it's the only area of enhancement in the breast aside from the normal vasculature. So ultrasound was done to the location of the palpable lump, and there's a very subtle finding. It's Almost it's isoechoic to hyperechoic, we would call, but it does correspond in size and location to the asymmetry we were initially seeing on mammogram. And biopsy was performed. And again, we want to assess that marker placement on the post-procedure mammogram, and it falls exactly in our area of enhancement. And this came back invasive lobular carcinoma. Next case is a 47-year-old with a newly palpable left breast mass. The triangular marker denotes her palpable. There's nothing notable on her mammogram. And ultrasound was done and was also negative. Because there was a persistent palpable concern, MRI was ordered. And here in the outer retroreolar tissue, we can see an irregular enhancing mass on our subtraction image. On the left is our sagittal, and the right is our axial image. 
and this was biopsied and came back DCIS. So just a reminder, CM is wonderful, but can have false negatives. Moving on to known cancers. This is a 54-year-old with a palpable right breast mass. And here, the finding on 2D imaging is fairly obvious. There is a large mass subjacent to the triangular marker denoting her palpable. Ultrasound was done and shows a 4.7 centimeter heterogeneously hypochloric mass. This was biopsied and found to be invasive ductal cancer. She underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy and she had her post-neo mammogram. And we can see there's a small biopsy marker in the location of her biopsy-proven cancer. And where we previously saw a mass, we're now seeing more of a focal asymmetry or at the very least a, a much decreased mass. But the question remains, is there residual disease? And on the recombined images, we see there's no residual enhancement. She went to lumpectomy that demonstrated no residual disease. She returned one year later for her post lumpectomy mammogram, and we see expected post surgical findings, both within the breast and under her arm. And the recombined images, so classic fat necrosis. So this is a nice example of a case of IDC where we were able to see that there was no residual disease post-neo and then classic post-lumpectomy findings of fat necrosis. And now I'll move on to some pitfalls and artifacts. Um, this is a patient with a history of left breast cancer, status post-lumpectomy five years prior. So you can see she has very dense breasts and some post-surgical changes in the left breast, but otherwise unremarkable exam. On the recombined images though, there's areas of enhancement in both breasts, but the radiologist uh, was smart to question artifact and told, asked the technologist to wipe the patient's skin before obtaining some lumpectomy views or spot views of the lumpectomy bed. So she wiped the skin. And then you can see here that that area of enhancement we previously saw has resolved. And so this is an example of skin contamination with contrast. Now I'll briefly touch on CEM guided biopsy. So it's important as we discussed to have a predetermined workflow for the evaluation of any recombined image findings where we don't see an sonographic or mammographic correlate. CEM guided biopsies are FDA approved, um, but there is limited availability. And so it's very common that when a finding is seen on the contrast only images without a mammographic or sonographic correlate that we pursue MRI and MRI guided biopsy. In uh, 2022, there was a nice uh, case report showing a case of an invasive lobular carcinoma diagnosed on 3D imaging and MRI showed additional masses. These additional masses were appreciated on contrast enhanced mammography and so they were able to biopsy using CEM. You can see the small square window is the view through which we perform the biopsy and purely or on this image, what's uh, higher and closer to the nipple is the biopsy proven cancer. And then posteriorly within that square is the target. And you can see the biopsy needle. UPMC also shared their initial experiences. They're a group with eight academic breast imagers, 28 women, and they had a total of seven cancers, one high risk uh, lesion and 20 benign lesions. And they um, found that patients were more comfortable or reported that they were more comfortable than they expected and that the procedure was faster than they expected. And interestingly, the strength of the enhancement throughout the study may be unrelated to the pathology. Con there was continuous enhancement in 96% of the lesions. And here's images of the biopsy. We have our scout image where we see our target and then biopsy. Another um, single center experience, a prospective single center study with 50 women at 51 CEM enhancing lesions that did not have a mammographic or sonographic correlate. There were 46 technically successful biopsies. Five were non-visualized, all of which were non-mass enhancement. That's a 9.8% cancellation rate and about on par with MR. And all were concordant. So 25 were benign, 10 high risk, and 11 malignant and none of the non-visualized or benign lesions were found to be malignant at follow-up. So it's important to consider if CEM biopsy and MRI guided biopsy are both either not available or not possible, we need a game plan of alternate approaches. So depending on the level of suspicion, we can consider short interval follow-up CEM, 
We can also attempt stereotactic biopsy or 3D guided biopsies using landmarks. And then rarely, but an option, is we can perform image guided localization using landmarks followed by surgical excision. So lastly, I'll finish with our take home points. CEM is useful for a variety of indications. As I shared cases of screening, um, palpable lumps, uh, post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy assessment and extent of disease. These findings can actually be quite subtle, and so it's important to adjust our windows. We want to use the BIRADS lexicon to make sure we're all speaking the same language and for validation of for studies. There is currently limited availability of CEM guided biopsies, so we have to always keep in mind that if CEM guided biopsy is not a possibility, to look for other ways to visualize and biopsy, whether that be 3D guidance, ultrasound, or MR. And then as I showed in a number of cases, that post-biopsy mammogram marker correlation is essential, not only if we're doing a CEM guided biopsy, but especially if we're targeting under another modality like MRI, it's a way to ensure that that MRI target does in fact correspond to the CEM lesion initially identified. So I just want a quick break for acknowledgments, particularly to Dr. Victoria Mango for um, providing me with so many examples um, and information and helping me to give this today. Dr. Jockelson, um, our division head here for connecting me in, uh, with you guys and Dr. Christopher Comstock and Dr. Janice Sell. Thank you for having me here today. That's, That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Amir. Um, you know, as I was telling you, we are just starting our CEM program mm -hmm. and actually go have our um, CEM biopsy training next week. So this is perfectly timed. Um, before I take questions from everyone, I had one question of my own. One thing we're dealing with is where does CEM fit in terms of screening for high-risk patients along with MRI? Do you do it in place of MR or do you replace the screening mammogram? So we typically are just doing one contrast study. So for particularly for intermediate risk patients and some high risk patients, um, patients with a history of breast cancer, uh, these are patients that we're commonly screening with contrast enhanced mammography. BRCA patients were skull screening with MRI, um, but we're only, it's, re it's replacing the MRI screening. So do you then do alternate every six months? Do they get their regular DBT and then the CEM alternating every six months? No. Uh, so these are obviously general answers, not for specific patients, but generally speaking, no, we just have our annual CEM. That's it. Um, I see. So, so they, again, this is a, it's based on a, obviously a patient's personal risk profile. There are some patients who are screened with MR and uh, DBT every six months and sometimes even ultrasound. So everybody's unique, but generally speaking, particularly for the intermediate risk population or patients with history of breast cancer that don't have any other genetic predisposition, we just do yearly CEM. I see. Thank you so much. And then uh, if anybody else has any questions, I'm just going to check the chat here. We don't have anything in the chat. Um, I'm going to see, I can't see any hands raised. Um, so I, at the risk of just taking up all your time, I'd mm -hmm. love to put the brain. Uh, what about billing? Are you getting paid for the contrast? So this, I should probably defer to my billing department. As, as far as I'm aware, yes, we are. And many insurance companies cover CEM. Yeah. And are your slots 30 minute mm -hmm. slots? How long is the slot? They are 30 minutes, uh, but we allow time for everything leading up to the mammogram. So we ask patients generally to come 15 minutes in advance for all for all studies. And we make sure that we have our CEM slots aligned with when we have uh, nursing support because our nurses are the ones who place the IV lines. Um, and then of course, these are read as diagnostic exams such that the patients are getting a real time read, a same day read. And so the radiologist is available to interpret, to ask for additional views add on the ultrasound as needed, and then of course be available for contrast uh, reaction monitoring. Perfect. And um, my last question is, um, for your six month follow-ups, are you doing the whole six month, six, 12, 18, and 24, or are you skipping the 18? It depends on what we're following. So there are some situations in which we may feel that an MRI is 
advantageous to evaluate. So it may be that we're giving a six month follow up with it, with recommendation for an MR. If that MR can explain the finding and is benign, we can do the six month, but then probably be finished. And there is data to suggest that if that's the case, we may not need to be following on these patients for two years. I don't have prospective data to show that, but there are a few retrospective uh, studies that that show that if MR is if ultrasound was negative and MR is negative, this is probably not a cancer. Um, and then we haven't had any situation in which we have then later found that that initial finding in question is a cancer. Um, okay. For other things though, um, so it, it's really a case by case basis of how we then follow. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, if there's no more questions, I think We'll give people back some of their time. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a really great, uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Dr. Amir. It was great to have you. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for coming. And we will look forward to another lecture soon. Good luck with your research, Dr. Amir and Dr. Saxena. And enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Bye. Thank you all.